go ahead and give you the answer to that. It's Jesus. He's at the door standing, patiently drawing near. That's a wonderful song. That's one of my favorites. And I personally requested that Danny um, add that to the list this morning for invitation purposes. As we look at a lesson this morning about Jesus Christ and the man that, that was called many different things. There are several different I am statements uh, in scripture. I am the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the great physician. Uh, there, there are multiple I am statements. And in John chapter 10 and other places, Jesus talks about being a door and it's relative to being a shepherd. Have you ever went through the wrong door? I went the wrong door. And there's times when the door leads to destruction. There's times when doors lead to happiness. The idea of a door brings to the light of the, of the listener or the thinker a passageway, a, a, an avenue, a, a place of transition from one place to another, a way by that we get in. Doors give access. Doors that are open give access. I've worked for several different types and styles of all of my life. Some of them had open door policies. Some of them didn't. And uh, the access that doors give many times have great value. Sometimes doors deny access. After 9-11, the doors of airplanes became something that were heavily fortified, so you could not get in. You'll see in a deeper study that you can do that the door to heaven was once like that. It was shielded by a great veil, four inches thick and 60 feet tall, that only the high priest of the tribe of Levi could enter into once a year, not without blood, for forgiveness and atonement. A great barrier stood in the tabernacle that Hebrews tells us, and among other places, was torn in two or taken down by Christ. Now he is the door. And that's exactly what he talks about in that passage. This passage talks about pasture and it talks about salvation. And Jesus Christ is the door to that salvation and passage. Not only that, he's the door to a specific group of people. Not that there's an elitism, not that there's a discrimination, not that there's anything like that, but he certainly does say, my sheep hear my voice. And they know what door to go through. John chapter 10, verse 1, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way is the same as a thief and a robber. So uh, this passageway, this entrance, this avenue, this place that we go through to a certain other place is very critical. It's very critical in how we go through it. It's very critical in the means by which we open it and the means by which we pass through because Evidently, if there's a deceiving way like a thief or a robber would do or a way that's not scriptural as it pertains to going through the door, then you're the same as thieves and robbers. It's, it's not the same value as we see as the door of truth. What is he the door to? There is a lot of things that Jesus Christ is the door to, and I want to just touch on three or four of them this morning and give you a few verses to back those things up, and then the lesson will be yours. Jesus Christ is the door to the love of God. God is love. It's the, it's the easiest principle in Scripture. I like when people ask me questions that are easy to answer scripturally. The the love of God is, is something that thousands of sermons can be built upon. 
we see God's love in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 in that he demonstrates his love for us. 1 John chapter 4 tells us in verse beginning in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But he who does not love doesn't know God nor for God is love. And verse 9 is also very key. 1 John chapter 4. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that, the, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Through Him. You see there? You see that door that Jesus is, the avenue to the love of God. God demonstrated His love for you and for me by giving Jesus Christ as a, as a passageway to him, an advocate we'll see. In John 3.16, we know, uh, if not the most popular verse in the Bible, certainly close to it, for God so loved the world, he, he so much loved us that he gave his son, his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the door to the love of God. Romans chapter 5, Paul writes to the church at Rome and talks about the great sacrifice that really God made in giving His Son and what that sacrifice did. In verse 6, he says, For when we were still, this is Romans 5, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God, look at this, demonstrated, showed us, manifested, demonstrated His love for us. In Jesus Christ He did. For it says, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, God is love. And the door to that love the avenue, the entrance, the, the way that we get to His love is through Christ. The disciple or the apostle that Jesus loved. He writes more about love than anybody else. He loved Jesus and He loved His family. In 1 John chapter 3, we see... Beginning in verse 16, the Bible says, By this we know love, because He laid down His life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us love not in word or in tongue, but in deed. God loved in deed and in truth. He loved in deed by sending Jesus Christ to die. He loved in deed by sending great men of faith like Abraham, Moses, Noah as examples, Romans 15, 4. The door to love, the door to the love of God is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the door to the family of God. I have two types of family, what I call blood kin and what I call family family, church kin, right, brotherhood. The Bible teaches that the church is a brotherhood. The church is the family of God. And we just lost, there we go. We see in 1 John again, chapter 5, verse 1, same book. Look at verse 1 in chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That, that's, a, that's becoming a child of God. Jesus would tell Nicodemus, as it pertained to salvation, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't in, in, inherit the kingdom. A new birth, a recreation, becoming a child is what we can get through that door of Jesus Christ. The idea of being born into or adopted into or part of a family is what the New Testament wants you to learn from study. 
We see in Galatians chapter 3 a passage that we use many times to justify the necessity of baptism for remission of sins as it pertains to salvation. It does teach that, but it also teaches something else. It teaches that our salvation, our eternity, that heaven is an inheritance. Now tell me amongst yourselves if I inherit your parents' wealth when they pass. If that's the case, there needs to be a sign-up sheet in the foyer. I'll sign up. Unless you're a child, you don't get the inheritance. And that's the, the message that Paul gives to the churches of Galatia, many of which... They weren't born in a certain lineage. To the Jew, family, and, and who you were born, the son of, was very important. If you were part of a mixed race or not part of the lineage of God, you weren't due the things that were part of the system of faith that the Jews had. That would ring very loudly in their ears in Galatians chapter 3. Speaking in the context of law, he says to them, Verse 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept under the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor bringing us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that, after faith has come, faith has come, folks. Faith in Jesus Christ has come. John three sixteen. Other places, whoever believes in Him should have everlasting life. When faith comes, you are no longer under the law, the law of Moses. You're no longer under that Jewish inheritance entitlement. You're no longer under that system of hierarchy that had inheritance. For you, verse 26, and you have, if you are a Bible marker, go back to the very first chapter in the first few verses when he reaches out to the saints, the saved, the church, the ones that are in Christ Jesus. For you, saved person, are all sons of God. All of us. If you're saved in the blood, in the church, in the family of God, you're sons of God. Through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek slave nor free, male nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And verse 29 is a key verse that often gets left unsaid. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. Ding! That would have rung really loudly. To the Jew, it would have solidified the idea that the Gentiles were part of the family. To the Gentile, it would have solidified the idea that they were part of the family. They were Worthy and had the same inheritance as the Jew. Jesus is the door to the family of God. What a wonderful privilege it is to be a child of God. When we believe and, uh, and we come to Jesus Christ and we know Him and we are believers in Christ Jesus, as many as receive Him. John chapter 1 verse 12. There's no limit. There's no limit to who can be in the family. Brother R.L. read earlier in Mark chapter 3 about who is my brother, who is my sister. Jesus said, whoever does the will. When you see that, word, that, that set of words, when it, when, that means whoever follows the command, does the will, obeys the commands of Jesus, obeys the will of God. Whoever does that is a, my brother. My sister, that's why I say Brother Gary, you know, Sister Paula. That's perfectly scriptural. Jesus is the door to the family. I love my family. I have uh, my blood kin. We, we love each other very much. But my Christian family, the family of God, is different. It's separate. It's set apart. I have family all over, and you do too. A great big circle of tens of thousands of family members. It's quite a blessing. 
Jesus is the door to the provisions of God. This could be a sermon in and of itself. I'm going to go quickly through this. But we all receive blessings from God. And that door, that avenue, that passage, that allowance is wide open through the blood of Christ for every single one of us. We get benevolence calls quite a bit here. Sometimes five or six or ten a day. And I think, of course, the things that I should think about how we reach out and how we help those people folks, but I think all of the provisions, all of the life-sustaining things that you need are in the church. And by the way, folks, the people that call, the, the ones that reach out to us for benevolence, are they're told that, they're, they're, I want you to know that they're getting that message, okay? It's not just we're doling out checks left and right, and certainly we don't qualify them too, too strenuously, but we do, I do every time mention of them that their spiritual needs are much more important. And the provisions that God gives us, every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 3, found in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness, what a, that's a pretty good provision. I'd say that ranks high up. I should have put that one first. Forgiveness in Christ Jesus through that door. The avenue of prayer, an advocate, Jesus Christ is. To, uh, in the ear of God, for us, he taught his disciples how to pray. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. When you pray, pray this way. And in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, he, he talks about that blessing and that prayer. And when we see him teaching, he says, Ask, seek, knock. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. If you have not found Christ, if you have not found that door, if you have not found salvation, if you have not found the truth, if you have not found the church, if you have not found it, it's because you have not been seeking it. Period. Or are indifferent. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. It's the avenue of prayer. He's the door to that prayer. And he's also the avenue to eternal life. In Matthew chapter 19, in verse 29, we see that to be the case. Leave it all, he says, and your inheritance will be a hundredfold. Now, some have taken that and what I call resting the scriptures or twisting or ringing or making them say something they don't that talk about wealth. And that has nothing to do with wealth other than the value of your soul. Hundredfold. Jesus is the door to peace of mind. Don't raise your hand. You don't have to do that. But who in this world would not like to have peace of mind? <laughs> I tell you what, when you get it, and I was in my 40s before I had it, when you get peace of mind, that's, that's really heavy. That's really a blessing. That's really some, casting your cares on Him. Peace that passes all understanding. There's something you don't understand why it happened. Something you don't understand why it's going on in your life. Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my mother? Why did this happen to my friend, my, my whoever? Why, why, why? Peace that passes all understanding. That door that Jesus is, is the avenue to that. It surpasses that. We give it to Him. We trust God. We know that we're, our inheritance will not change. We have peace of mind. And we have fellowship. That's a, that's a sermon right there. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, see us in the light. We are continually cleansed in His blood. That, that present active verb, it always keeps cleaning you. And, and we have fellowship, koinonia, knit together with one another. I'm not knit together with blood kin in some ways. I love them. If they need a kidney, I'll give them one. Anything they need. But I'm not knit together. I'm not koinonia because the koinonia, the agent that knits you together is blood. When you're down in that water and washed in the blood and raised to walk in newness of life, you are added, you're woven in, you're grafted, Paul would say, Hebrew writer would say, excuse me. Paul said it too. 
in Corinthians. You're grafted together. You're, you're molded together. And, and it's knit. It's koinonia. That's fellowship. Jesus is the door to the provisions of God. And I need fellowship with you. I need that. It's more than just a meal. It's a lot deeper than that. Jesus is the door to the presence of God. When we come to the throne room of God, we cannot enter that without Jesus Christ. Like I mentioned, the destruction of the veil, it tore top to bottom to, signif to signify from heaven. God is holy. God is most holy. And Isaiah chapter 6, the first 10 verses about the holiness of God. Not right now, I'm preaching. But when you do, See the holiness of God and see that, that and understanding the tabernacle pattern, the, the type and shadow of the church, that that whole, most holy place, you can't go in there. You can't. Regular old folk could not go in, could not enter in. But now, as Jesus as our high priest, we have an advocate with the Father, and he gives us an avenue to the presence, the very presence of God. God must be approached through sacrifice. He always has been approached through sacrifice and through a priest. And Jesus is our high priest. He is that door that we get to the presence of God. You can sit or stand or, or pray before God Almighty, just you, without anybody else. No priest, no Father, quote unquote, no, anybody else, just you, if you're in the blood, if you are saved, if you're in the body, if you're in the family, if you are in the blood of Christ. Of course, we know Jesus is our sacrifice and priest. Hebrews points that out vividly. A high priest of good things to come. Hebrews 9, 11. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us one God, one mediator, Jesus Christ, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One God, one mediator or thoroughfare or, or way to get to that door, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, we have an advocate. You know what an advocate is? Young people, an advocate is somebody who does something for you. If you have, if you've applied for Social Security and they deny you, promise you they will, and they deny you again, they deny you again, you hire an advocate. They do the work for you. You hire uh, an attorney. We have uh, members here that are attorneys. They're, they do something for you. They represent you. We have an advocate in Christ Jesus. And that door to the presence of God, imagine that presence of God. That, you see how this could have been a series? <laughs> it really could. And finally, we see that Jesus is the door to salvation. A very simple and plain thought. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Three things that he ams, right? He is the door. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. And by the way, the way you enter that door is significant. Don't let anybody tell you that the way that you're saved is insignificant. Because Jesus says in John 10, if you come as a thief and a robber, he distinguishes the way that you go through the door. So it's not only the door that you go through that's important, which would be Christ Jesus, but how you go through it. If you can't pick that up from this study of John 10, we need, some, we need to give you a little bit of help and encouragement. If you come as a thief and a robber, if you come through false pretense, if you come through false teaching, read the context of that. There are many about that teach false ways to be saved. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. <laughs> Matthew 7. There are many who say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not given gifts in your name? Have we not done these things? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. You, you didn't enter the door the right way. Well, come on, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to go up the ladder. Sometimes you got to go through the basement. Sometimes you got to go different. Nope. 
Other doors lead to hell. Is where they lead to. And how you enter that door is significant. There are many doors in life, but only one that leads to eternal life. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 15 says, The simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Don't just take for granted what your preacher says is true. I have keen eyes and ears listening upon me, and I'm certain that in love that they would come to me if something was in error. But that's not always the case, is it? Sometimes people stand before congregations, people stand before the lost, and they give them a combination to the key of the kingdom that's not going to open the door. Or maybe it is that it's the thief and the robber way. Have you passed through that door? Have you passed through the door that Jesus is to get you to the Father? To get you to the provisions of God? To get you to, into the family of God? If you think that you did, and maybe it was by the way of a thief or a robber, a different way, maybe make that right today. Jesus says He is the way, the truth, and the life. A wonderful door is standing for you. And the love of God demonstrated through Jesus Christ is the means by which we go through that door. He loves you. He gave His Son to die for you. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and He is, if you believe that He was born of a virgin and died a cruel death on a cross, and He did, if you believe that He raised again the third day, there were 500 witnesses. And 2,000 years later, we're still faithful and strong to that concept. If you believe that you are lost, if you believe that you have sin in your life, Romans 3, 23 says you do if you're not saved. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're willing to confess Christ, if you're willing to confess Him as your Savior and that He is Jesus and He is the Son of God, then you'll need to do a couple of more things. You'll need to repent. Turn. Turn. We're going to have, the night sermon is about repentance. Turn 180 degrees from your sin. Turn from that lifestyle. And obey the gospel by becoming a Christian and being baptized for remission of sin. Added to the church, Acts 2, 42 through 47. Koinonia, family, provisions, prayer, the presence of God, the blessings of God are all there. The door is open. We, as a family, Summer and I, were reminded, many of you shared in our reminder, of how quickly things can change. Now, we were blessed, <laughs> I think, that, um, you know, Fowler wouldn't hurt and nobody was killed and those types of things, but that phone call could have been a lot different. Amen? And some, one day that door's going to shut for you, and we're just proud that, and glad that we have another day with our son. Because I have friends that don't have days with their daughters and son. Today, if you need to respond, if you need to put on Christ in baptism, if you need to enjoy the blessings of God and His love, make that known. Let us all be standing. Brother Dan is going to come and lead us. Ooh, at the door.